As a longtime partner of the West Virginia Community Development Hub and someone who has watched their work across the state of West Virginia, if you've seen a thriving and growing downtown, um, like Stephanie has mentioned, I can assure you that the West Virginia Community Development Hub has played a role in helping convene and build the capacity so that their downtowns and their community um, are, are collectively working together to rebuild, um, to, to rebuild those downtowns. And the work is significant, but like Stephanie mentioned, it's not easy, it's not, it doesn't happen overnight, and it's not magic. It takes everyone working together and understanding the end goal that we're all trying to get to. And so I would encourage you all to learn more about the West Virginia Community Development Hub, as well as um, chat with NRGRDA, the HAV, about our work in partnerships um, with the hub and, and how we balance the economic and community development of the region. So thanks, Stephanie. So next up, I want to invite um, my next panelist, who is, um, let me make sure my tech is working here. Um, so we are going to invite Jordan Maynor. So it gives me great respect that Jordan chose to be with us today. Do Jordan and I have, have had a long time economic development relationship long before um, he was a delegate in the 41st district. And so it really truly is an honor for me um, to have Jordan on this panel today. His legislative career is distinguished um, and he has unwavering co commitment to fostering economic development and growth within our state and the region. His work in the legislature embodies critical role that policy and legislative support play in creating a conducive environment for economic prosperity. Jordan has been at the heart of crafting and advancing legislation that not only incentivizes economic development, but also paves the way for innovative and sustainable growth across multiple industries. Through his efforts, West Virginia has seen significant advancements in policies designed to attract businesses, support entrepreneurs, and strengthen our economic infrastructure. Today, Jordan will share his insights on the importance of legislative support in economic development, highlighting the impactful work that has he has accomplished in recent recent years to bolster our state's economy and secure a brighter future for all West Virginians. Join me in warmly welcoming Delegate Jordan Maynard. Well, that was quite the introduction. Good morning. How's everybody doing this morning? I want to take a moment and I have to do this again. Michelle, you are a rock star. You, we don't understand what we have in our leadership here locally. And I just have to give her one more shout out this morning because she is incredible. She is extremely competent. She cares and um, she's a good friend. So thank you for having us here this morning. Thank you for leading this. We appreciate you. Uh, next, I wanna say thank you to all the candidates. Um, I see a lot of candidates out in the, uh, in the auditorium here. Uh, I was accosted by a couple, in the, I'm kidding, uh, as soon as we walked in. And so let me tell you, putting your name on the ballot is a, is a big thing, and it is not an easy thing. It's not an easy thing for us as candidates, for our families, but my respect goes out to each and every one of you for being willing to step up, move forward, and, and serve our community. So thank you all so much for doing that. We appreciate you. Um, where to begin? Uh, again, my name is Jordan Maynard. I know most of you, if I've not had the chance to meet you, I would love to get around there and at least shake your hand and say hello. I am the delegate that represents the 41st district, which encompasses uh, a sliver of Raleigh County, the Beaver, Daniel, Shady Spring, part of Cool Ridge area, and then I also represent parts of Summers and Mercer County. And it's great to be here this morning. When I was asked to do this, I got really excited because as anybody, anybody that knows me knows that I am passionate about economic development. And the reason for that is I was born and raised in Southern West Virginia. I have four children that I am raising in Southern West Virginia. And my passion is to see those children, not force them to stay here when they graduate high school or graduate college, but at least have an opportunity to stay here, 
to play here, to work here, and to raise their own families here. And so as anybody in here that has kids, has family, we've seen them you know, grow up and move away, and we're trying to put an end to that. So at the legislature, what are some of the things that we have been embarking on to make sure that we can attract new industry, but also help existing industry within our state? And I can rattle off a, a lot of them. Um, the first thing I want to emphasize to everyone this morning is West Virginia is in competition with not only our surrounding states, but our entire country and the rest of the world. And so oftentimes when you look at what the legislature is doing, our philosophy is not only to be good enough with what Virginia, Kentucky, Maryland, Ohio, Pennsylvania are doing, but to be better than them because it is a competition and it is a winner take all competition. Let me tell you, um, I'll give you the perfect example. I deal with um, local economic development, as Jenna said. There's a company that I've been very close with over the past six to seven years that employs around 30 people here in southern West Virginia. They are looking to expand because they got a big contract recently, multi-million dollar contract, and they would like to hire 30 more people. And you know what they came to us and said? Virginia is offering us a site and a building for free. Not only to do this expansion project, but to move our entire operation across the border and set up there. Now, as a business owner, what am I to do? What am I, what am I here to do? What is my point here? We are in competition with our neighbors and the rest of the country. As policymakers, we have to do everything in our power to enhance the environment, as was talked about earlier for our uptown and downtown development, through tax policy, through regulatory policy, through judicial policy, and all of the above. Because again, we can't continue to lose folks or not be competitive with our neighbors. And let me tell you, there, there are site selectors all around the country, and I'm sure Jenna will get into this, if not today, at some point in the near future. There are site selectors all around the country that are looking to locate. And the work that we have done over the last decade is actually getting West Virginia looks. And the biggest thing that we run into are our sites. Let me tell you, having flat, developable, ready to go land. And not just developable, but the infrastructure is in place and it's ready to be shovel ready to build on right now. And so as Jenna mentioned, I was proud to lead sponsor a bill that enhanced our certified sites program at the state. And I'm not trying to get down into the weeds too much with you, but um, this program really will identify various sites around the state in order to help us put those on the map so that when companies are looking to move here or expand here, we've got them ready to go to sh show them, say, hey, we've got 75 acres here ready to go for you. And that's something that's been missing for a long time in the state. Um, so again, you know, my philosophy as a West Virginia legislature is what, what can we do to be as competitive as possible? And that's on multiple fronts. Again, it's on tax policy. We did the biggest tax cut in the history of the state this past, um, this just recently in the last year, 21 and a quarter percent. You say, well, how does that help businesses? We're talking about personal income tax cut. Most businesses are small businesses that are passed through income right down to your pocketbooks and your, your, your wallets. And so getting the taxes lower to be competitive is a huge thing, getting the environment and the regulatory structure right, getting our sites developed, making sure that you know, our judicial system is on par, if not better than the rest of the country. We can be competitive. People are looking at us right now. They are looking at West Virginia and what we've done as far as the legislative fixes. Now, we need to get ready and take it to the next level by developing our sites and then the last thing I'm going to mention is operating at the speed of business. We landed, anybody remember the Nucor announcement, the Nucor Steel announcement in Mason County? Huge fortune whatever company. It's, it's, it's a huge, it's the biggest steel producer in the world, steel manufacturer in the world. Do you know why we landed that in West Virginia? Because we as a government have streamlined to the point we beat Pennsylvania to the punch. And our government operates at the speed of business so that if you need something, if you need incentives, if you need to work on a land deal, whatever you need, we're going to drop everything that we're doing. We're going to work with you. We're going to dedicate the time and the attention to get the deal done. So 
All this to say, I could ramble for, for a long time up here on everything the legislature's done. We have done a lot. We have to get better. It's always a work in progress. We are not a finished product. But as, as delegate and as the legislature, I, I believe I can speak for the entire legislature, we are committed to economic development in this state. We are committed to seeing not only new industry come here, but to foster and help our, our existing businesses and companies expand and become better. And so with that, I know we're going to have a fireside chat with various topics, and I uh, look forward to it. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Jordan. So Stephanie and Jordan talked a lot about the work that we all do collectively. Um, and so I want to pivot for just a moment um, and, and shift in my role as moderator to that of a panelist um, at this point. So I'm very, very eager <clears throat> to dive into a subject that's very close to my heart, which is educating on the importance of innovative approaches to attraction and retention of businesses. You've heard a lot about this from our two panelists today. But what I want to explain to you all and what I want to elaborate on is how these strategies are critical for further developing our workforce, our ready product, and amplifying economic impact across our region. So first, I want to briefly um, give an overview for those that are not familiar with the New River Gorge Regional Development Authority. So we are a four-county economic development authority serving Raleigh, Fayette, Nicholas, and Summers counties. Um, it's our goal to create and retain jobs, stimulate investment, and support sustainable development of communities. The organization was created 35, almost 36 years ago by an act of legislation and is the first and large, still largest economic development authority in the state of West Virginia. It was pretty um, in innovative at the time for, um, and I think even now, uh, there are a few uh, regional economic development authorities in the state, and it was pretty innovative that 35 years ago, a group of regional representatives that culminated in Beckley, Raleigh County, <clears throat> sat around and said, you know what, we recognize that the importance of a regional approach and the importance of working together needs to be formalized in a way that bonds us together through legislative action so that we can really see these larger impacts and work together to benefit the people and the places of the entire region. So the NRGRDA was created. A lot of you all might remember it being called 4C. Not sure um, why we went away from that because now it's a mouthful of the New River Gorge Regional Development Authority. But um, many, many of the players that are still involved in local leadership were at the table 35 years ago to create our organization. <clears throat> we acknowledge that the key areas of focus for economic development are traditional in the sense that most economic development authorities focus on those same, um, same traditional practices. But at NRGRDA, we have to be really creative and innovative um, because we are in the middle of the nation's newest natural asset of our natural park, and at the time, the natural river, the National River. And the importance of acknowledging this is that we have to constantly balance nature and commerce. How are we ensuring that the quality of place and the quality of the environment matches the quality of the workforce and the businesses and industries that we, we locate in, that we locate in the region? So we do this through sort of four key focus areas. The first is business attraction and retention. NRGRDA works to attract new businesses in the region and retain existing ones by offering support services, access to financing, and working with public leadership to develop the incentives. You'll hear us talk more about incentives as, as we continue the presentation, but they're vitally important to being competitive, like Jordan mentioned. So working with our public leaders and our elected officials to ensure that they understand the importance of incentivizing business development and, and community development is crucial for business attraction and retention. Workforce development is another area that we focus on. We recognize the importance of a skilled workforce. We can recruit an industry all day. If we don't have the skilled labor force to serve their need, there, we're, there's, no, um, there's no reason for us to attempt to recruit. We're not competitive in that space. So while we prioritize having those ready sites, as Jordan mentioned, because we know that's our first, first foot in the door, we also are going to have to be prepared with a skilled workforce. So we work really closely with our educational institutions, training providers, and businesses to develop programs that align with the needs of employers and the aspirations of the larger workforce. 
Another key area of, of focus for us is infrastructure development. You're gonna hear a lot about infrastructure and I want you all to think a little bit outside of the box. While infrastructure traditionally means water, sewer, fiber, electric, nat natural gas, it also means bridges and roads and sidewalks and housing and childcare and all of those key important infrastructure issues that are needed to create a thriving and growing workforce and economy. So when we think about infrastructure, we've, we've long prioritized those, those, five, those big five um, utilities, but we have to start acknowledging that the development of industrial parks, broadband expansion, transportation services, child care services, um, redevelopment in downtowns, and other community assets are key infrastructure to ensuring that we have, um, that we are a competitive region. We also um, focus on community development. So beyond the economic metrics that we traditionally work in, NRGRDA invests in projects to improve the quality of life in the region, including downtown revitalization, recreation facilities, and cultural initiatives. While we are not the leaders of these initiatives, there are many others like our friends at the West Virginia Community Development Hub, we partner and we invest in the services that they provide to ensure that our communities have access to the resources in community development. The final area of focus is one that I am most proud of, which is our entrepreneurship and small business support. Most economic development authorities in the state have to choose between the big wins and the small wins. And what I mean by that is the big wins are the large companies like the new cores of, of West Virginia and other big announcements that you hear that employ hundreds of people. But the small wins are just as important to us. We recognize that a thriving downtown and a thriving entrepreneurship community creating hundreds of jobs through small business development is just as important as one large win. So our most notable program at NRGRDA is our West Virginia Hive program. You'll see our booth over to the left and some of our staff that is there. Our West Virginia Hive program serves a 13 county footprint in Southern West Virginia. So outside of our four, they serve a total of 13. They have tailored business support and advising services to ensure that every entrepreneur that we serve has access to a tailored individualized program and journey to support the needs of their, their growing business. And our goal is to grow those businesses into larger big wins that NRGRDA can provide those site selection, building development services for. So again, you'll hear a lot along the way about NRGRDA success that's built on strong collaborations with local governments, state agencies, st all elected officials, educational institutions, private sector, and community organizations. These partnerships are crucial and a coordinated approach to regional development ensures that efforts are aligned with broader economic goals and community needs. So what innovative strategies are we seeing that work? So Jordan talked a lot about site development and there's many others that the legislature is involved in that, that we'll dive into. But I wanna talk about some of the innovative incentives that you all are hearing a lot about in the news and in community meetings that may be slightly confusing and a little bit um, cumbersome to understand, but I wanna share why these are important and why incentives have to be considered in order to be competitive. So one of our first and most frequently used incentives that we have for businesses that locate in the region is what we call a pilot agreement. So pilot agreements are a payment in lieu of tax. And what these do is they create an incentive that attract or retain businesses. So businesses and property developers agree to make a standard payment to a local government that's less than the property taxes they would normally owe, and they're usually parter than a broader range of incentives aimed at encouraging investment. One of our most recent, recent large announcements in the region and the sponsor of this panel, um, Klockner Pentaplast, um, chose to locate, in, lo locate their expansion in Beaver, West Virginia because of the incentives that we built out for them. They were looking in Virginia as Jordan mentioned, who oftentimes does have a more attractive incentive package than we're available to offer. But I commend the Raleigh County Commission for working closely with us to develop a pilot agreement that ultimately created a scenario that allowed um, Klockner to structure their initial investment over a period of five years with the promise that they would create 75 jobs. 
And if, in fact, at the end of that period of time that the pilot agreement expired, if they do not create those jobs, the, the repayment is expected to be made back to the county commission. This was one very easy tool in our toolbox of incentives for us to be able to offer. Um, and it also includes, oftentimes will include provisions that include the private sector or the company investing in community infrastructure or public services or other public benefits in exchange for that traditional property tax payment. So pilots are a very innovative tool that allow us to be um, flexible, nimble, and also provide an incentive um, at the local level that attract businesses. One of the other areas that we are struggling in the most is housing. So a lot of, um, you'll hear across West Virginia that we do not have adequate housing. And a lot of this is due to um, abandoned and dilapidated structures, a lot of this is due to lack of investment, and a lot of this is due to a lack of a strategy around a housing um, a development initiative in the communities. But I have to commend the legislature for passing the Build West Virginia Act. So the Build West Virginia Act, in my opinion, is one of the most innovative housing incentive packages passed by the West Virginia legislature. So the, the um, objectives of the Build West Virginia Act, and there are a lot of other pieces that go into this, is one, to stimulate residential housing development. The act focuses on encouraging construction of housing in certified Build West Virginia districts and aims to meet housing and employment needs while having a significant and positive economic impact on West Virginia. The objectives are also to have certification by state authorities. Districts eligible for Build West Virginia projects are certified through an agreement among Secretaries of Commerce, Economic Development and Tourism based on a specific set of criteria that includes economic impact and housing needs. What the Build West Virginia initiative and act provides are an incredible tax incentive to those looking to develop housing in the region. One of the incentives is a sales tax exemption. This directly used it is directly used on the purchases in the construction of certified Build West Virginia projects, includes building materials and services, and it ex exempts consumer sales and service tax. So again, the tax incentive, the sales tax exemption is passed on to the developer so that they can um, purchase their raw materials for the housing development at a lower cost. There is also a property value adjustment credit included. So eligible taxpayers or owners of that property can take that property value adjustment credit against personal or corporate income tax, beginning the tax year when the construction is completed at a rate of one-tenth of the improved property value adjustment credit for up to 10 years. So that's huge, a 10-year property value adjustment credit for housing development. And then there is also a potential B&O tax exemption. Municipalities hold the power to authorize a B&O tax exemption for income derived from certified Build West Virginia project properties. So again, the Build West Virginia tax incentive is one, one um, strategy and a step in the right direction that the West Virginia legislature has prioritized housing and incentivizing housing in the state of West Virginia. We have a couple other incentives that we traditionally use at NRGRDA. Another of those is a lease revenue bond. As a public entity, a lease revenue bond has proven key to construction financing. A lot of these large projects with rising construction costs are outside of the lending limits of traditional financers. And so while our bank partners are still crucial to lease revenue bonds, we do acknowledge that lease revenue bonds serve as a key to that construction financing process. Banks still serve a vital role as a trustee, as takeout financing, but um, it's, it's an innovative approach to the development and the expansion of the project. You most recently heard that NRGRDA issued our first ever lease revenue bond to support the construction of the Klockner Pentaplast facility at $19 million. We worked with two local banks as part of that deal, as well as many others, including the Raleigh County Commission and the Building Commission, but that lease revenue bond allowed us to offer a competitive rate for the construction financing um, of that project for the expansion. Otherwise, we would have lost that expansion in our region. The last two incentives are, are ones that um, we've heard a lot about recently in the Beckley-Raleigh County area. I want to sort of just touch on the benefit of public-private partnerships as an incentive. 
So public-private partnerships, also known as PPPs, leverage the strength of both the public and private sectors by leveraging resources and sharing the risk, which makes investment more attractive from the private sector. We've witnessed PPPs and as successful initiatives in developing critical infrastructure like broadband, roads, bridges, other digital infrastructure that underpins economic growth, especially in areas that may not be as attractive for private investment without public incentives. So I encourage those of you all who are interested in learning more about how public and private partnerships work together to incentivize um, business development to chat with us, me, my team, any of us on this stage, because there is a very vital role for the public entity in supporting the private investment and, and removing the risk from the private sector. Finally, um, we work very closely with our Workforce West Virginia um, folks that you'll see throughout the day um, to, to offer on-the-job training and incumbent worker training. And so while many are not aware of this, um, most all of the businesses in our region, large or small, are eligible for on-the-job training support. Um, so if you have a company or you are part of a company that has a training period at the beginning of your um, onboarding with a new employee, the Workforce West Virginia and the Workforce Development Board have very um, flexible and usable incentives to support that training period of up to $2,000 per employee during that training period. So many folks are not aware of these on-the-job training um, incentives that are offered, but they are a way for an employer and the private sectors to subsidize that training period to ensure that they are stabilizing their profit during that training period that is required for most of our industries. So moving ahead, what is NRGRDA focused on for our region? We recognize that we have led the charge in site readiness in Raleigh County and Southern West Virginia. Again, you heard that, um, you heard Jordan mention that he was a lead sponsor on a bill for the site readiness Yes West Virginia initiative in the state. I applaud the legislature, we were the last State on the eastern half of the U.S. to um, have a site readiness strategy and we now officially have one. It was not without um, a lot of work that economic development authorities have done to help educate the legislature and educate those that are not familiar with site readiness in the region. And again, we should be proud that Raleigh County houses the first ever site ready, proactively uh, built site ready site at the Raleigh County Memorial Airport. Again, it is, a, it is proof of if we have ready sites, we will locate employers. But while we know that site readiness has been our um, main focus for the last three years at NRGRDA, we are acknowledging that we are moving ahead in our economic development priorities while still ensuring that we have sustainable growth in the areas we've previously prioritized. So our first economic development priority is housing. So while we know that we are not recruiters of housing developers, we also know that we know the highest and best use of the properties that we have available. And so while we acknowledge that working through the comprehensive planning process with um, our municipalities and our counties is vital to acknowledging the usability of a site and the highest and best use of a site, we also acknowledge that through the land banking of abandoned and dilapidated structures, we can master plan areas for housing development to make them um, attractive to developers to locate. We also have a priority at NRGRDA to become a Build West Virginia region. So we are very fortunate that Fayette, Fayetteville was our first Build West Virginia district. And that Build West Virginia district encompasses a 20 mile radius of the municipality that is awarded. We have strategically positioned a municipality in each of our four county footprint to overlap and apply for the Build West Virginia initiative so that we will have a Build West Virginia region. So we will be working specifically in Beckley in Raleigh County to ensure that a Build West Virginia Virginia designation is sought so that we can have that district as an incentive to locate housing developers. We also are embarking on a regional housing assessment. So our team is moving forward with Bowen National 
They are a nationally known um, housing firm in the United States and have done a lot of the housing assessments throughout the, the state of West Virginia. We recently engaged Bowen, and by recently I mean like two weeks ago, engaged Bowen to enter into a contract for a regional housing assessment. As part of this assessment, we will not only identify areas for development and the type of housing that is needed, we will have an additional seasonal workforce housing strategy to support the outdoor recreation and the seasonality of the housing that is needed for that particular portion of the industry. So we will be engaging with our chambers of commerce, our counties, and our local officials as we embark on this housing assessment, and we're very excited that our region will officially have a formalized housing assessment. Our second priority moving ahead outside of child care, is, or outside of um, housing, is child care. So this is something that affects all of us. Um, we have acknowledged that uh, a lot has changed in economic development post-COVID. We have acknowledged that prior to COVID, we were seeing a lot of our companies that were interested in the competitiveness of the site, locations for distribution, and they wanted to be in industrial parks that were sort of siloed off in their own bubble. Post COVID, everything has changed. We are now recognizing that when site selectors reach out to us and companies want to locate, that they are looking for not only housing for their workforce, they're looking for childcare, for their workforce. We know that this is a key piece of infrastructure that is very much needed, um, that the legislature has indicated they are prioritizing. We'll talk more about that in a moment, but with at NRGRDA, we are looking at two um, policy initiatives for childcare. One is we currently have on-the-job training resources for a lot of the manufacturers in our areas, but one of the crucial components to childcare that we see is um, supporting and subsidizing the cost during the training period for the childcare provider. So we acknowledge that a lot of times this becomes a retention issue with the workforce in a child care facility. And while many of us say, well, why don't we just incentivize a new child care facility to open? We understand that child care is a public service. It's not a profitable business model. And so we have to retrain our thinking to ensure that we're um, in incentivizing and subsidizing child care as a, an economic development priority and a, and a social need. So we are looking um, and we are calling on our legislature uh, to build out a training credit and make the existing Governor's Guaranteed Workforce Program and um, on-the-job training programs applicable for the child care industry. We know that they currently are prioritizing the manufacturing industry and it is a phenomenal resource that can easily be expanded into the child care facility. So we'll be working really hard to educate the legislature on that. We also have an incredible piece of legislation that was passed a couple years ago that created a 50% tax credit for employer-based childcare facilities. Any employer that, that has a childcare facility that they invest in for their employees' use receive a 50% credit on the startup costs and construction costs um, for the development of that facility. This is ve a very aggressive credit, but we want to see it at 100%. So we're going to continue to fight for 100% of an employer-based facility tax credit. We also have worked with the legislature over the last year to ensure that multiple manufacturers and employers can convene together to collectively invest in a child care facility and split that credit amongst them. And so the legislature has, um, has heard us and we are working with a lot of others um, in the child care network to ensure that... Um, that we are educated and we are providing the data that's coming from our workforce and our employers to ensure that we're developing those child care incentives. The last two areas of um, priority for NRGRDA as we move forward, um, our, my colleague, my, my friend and colleague, Danny Twilley, could not be with us today. Danny is with the Outdoor Economic Development Collaborative, and they are really working to change the landscape of the outdoor industry as it relates to economic development um, in the state of West Virginia. So we work very closely with them to build out um, capacity around um, the development of new recreation assets as well as the prioritizing the infrastructure needed to locate the outdoor gear manufacturers in our region. 
But we have two priority areas that we as NRGRDA are championing for outdoor economic development. One is um, working with our local our local officials at both the municipal and the county level to ensure that we have funding identified for the maintenance and sustainability of recreation assets. We understand that the development of those assets are critically important, but um, we are also seeing that when investment in these assets are thrust on small communities, they do not have the, um, the funding to maintain and sustain those recreation assets. So we will be working to identify funding opportunities that can be used to support local maintenance and sustainability of those assets. We also will continue to advocate strongly for an Office of Outdoor Recreation at the state of West Virginia. We know that we have um, done so much work through our Department of Tourism, who you're going to hear from over the next couple days. But we also acknowledge that many states that, are, uh, that we are competitive with in the outdoor recreation space have dedicated offices of outdoor recreation. And so it is important that we acknowledge this from not only the larger economic perspective, but looking at the outdoor industry as an economic driver rather than just um, a driver of visitation rates. Our final priority moving forward is our downtown redevelopment initiatives. Many of you all are familiar with um, our staff and the work that we have done around the redevelopment and the, the moving of dirt in um, the buildings that we have. However, working closely with partners like the, community the West Virginia Community Development Hub, we have acknowledged that there is a real shortage in prioritization of funding for Main Streets and the programs that support and incentivize downtown redevelopment and location. We will in continue to encourage um, and support the hub's policy priorities as well as champion the, the priorities around um, refunding and additional funding for the Main Street program in West Virginia, which was crucial to um, the success of downtown redevelopment and development in general. And we will also work with um, our local, regional, and state entities um, on facade improvement funding. We know that the hub is doing a ton of work around facade improvements and trying to um, build the case for investment in facade improvement. We also know that this is a priority of the um, Beckley Raleigh County Chamber of Commerce. Michelle has very much champion, championed um, the need for facade improvement in our downtown. And so as in our GRDA, we will continue to help advocate for these resources. So that's a lot about incentives and that's like a very tiny amount of the incentives that we use. Um, but Understanding that a lot of work and time goes into this, the one thing that I want to acknowledge before we move into the fireside chat portion of this and sort of get into some specifics is this is all about collaboration. I think you've heard this from Stephanie as well as Jordan. It takes every single one of us in every single role understanding the end goal and working together and knowing that this work is long and sometimes dirty and sometimes um, exhausting. But at the end of it, we all come out with a, a, a moment of pride that we can see um, the, the tangible redevelopment and new developments happening in our communities. And so again, while um, we serve as a resource and, and for a lot of these initiatives that we talk about, we are very fortunate to have the ecosystem that we do at a local state, at local and state lateral level and even a federal level to ensure that we're all working collaboratively towards the, the same goal. So again, a lot about incentives today, but I wanted, I know we've, we've heard a lot as we're approaching, um, we're approaching, we're in the middle of election season and we're approaching a lot of change in our, um, our landscape and our legislative landscape. I wanna make sure that, that we know that there are tools that are very important to understand and be educated on so that we can be in these conversations and offer these as resources um, to move the, the, move the needle in Southern West Virginia. So I wanna thank our panelists for their presentations this morning and I wanna move us into the fireside chat. So this is really the heart of today's dialogue. Um, I want to work through some really common themes, which is what's working, uh, where we're gonna celebrate some milestones, and you're gonna hear about some very specific and more specifics about some of the things I've chatted about already. We're also gonna talk about what COGS are in motion. What are we aware of or not aware of um, that may be going on that we need to, to make sure we're keeping our finger on the pulse of. 
And then finally, we're gonna talk about what's still needed. We definitely don't have all the answers. We know there's a lot of work to do, but we wanna talk about um, what our, when we acknowledge our strategies and our priorities, what is still needed. So we are going to, to talk through um, some questions with our panelists, and I would encourage you all to think about these things as we're, as we're having this conversation so that we can ask those questions and make sure that you get out um, any of the sort of burning, burning questions that you all have. So I'm gonna shift over to our fireside chat. She's doing um, in downtown redevelopment as well as community capacity building, which is crucial to ensuring the long-term sustainability of our downtowns and our communities. So can you sort of share how downtown redevelopment initiatives have leveraged some of the community strengths and led to that sort of sustainability? And really, how does it align with the broader economic objectives of the state? Yeah, definitely. So. Um, the biggest thing that we say with communities that we work with, and the West Virginia Community Development Hub works with communities that have a population of 500 to communities that have a population of 45,000. You know, so it doesn't really matter the size of a community. Redevelopment can happen in any place, but it's not like a light switch where you can just turn it on and everything transforms. It takes years of sustained work. We are talking about generational investments. You know, I think that we, as I mentioned before, we've been through a generational economic decline and we are all working very hard to build revitalization for our state. But it does mean that we have to show up every day and it's not just a one-year process, a five-year process, or even a 10-year process. You have to build the small wins that build up over time into larger transformation. I'm really sorry that Danny isn't here with us today because the piece around outdoor economic development and the outdoor industry is, I think, one of the brightest spots in economic development in West Virginia right now. I wanna talk a minute about a program that the Hub is doing that I think is a great example of how you can lean into assets in a place to drive forward really diverse economic development with a lot of different partners. The Hub has a program called Downtown Appalachia Revitalizing Recreational Economies. <sighs> Dare. And that's a program that for us is about putting technical assistance investments into fit the, uh, into the built environment of a set of communities that have come together to create a region that's focused on their outdoor economy. So it's the Mon Forest region. And the hub didn't start the, the work around the Mon Forest region. There was a collaborative that came together and said there are a set of counties that are in a region, similar to our region here, that have a central asset of the Mon Forest and we wanna to work together to market ourselves and to build assets that will attract tourists, that will attract new residents and drive economic development. So this was a change because previously these communities competed with each other. They had you know, high schools that historically compete with each other. They could be five miles apart from each other and they would say, don't go to that town, come to our town, right? And they had to understand that that scarcity approach of fighting against each other was actually keeping them all back. When they started to understand how you work together as a region in an intentional strategic aligned approach, that brought in more resources, that brought in more development. 
So the Mon Forest region and the approach with that strategy is multifaceted, and our program is just one small piece of the work. All right, so what the hub does is we have worked with each of the communities that are Mon Forest communities, and we're providing funding for redevelopment of their downtowns, of the buildings in their downtowns, because that was a piece that was missing in the redevelopment strategy. So you can build new outdoor infrastructure, you can <clears throat> attract tourists, you can work on the housing, but if you're not investing in redeveloping the buildings in the central business district of those communities, there's no real place for people to go when they come, right? So if people come to visit, they just stay in their cabins, they maybe go down the mountain to buy their groceries, to shop, to do whatever. They don't understand that they're actually in a community, they're in a region, and the dollars can stay in that place. So DARE and the work that we're doing with dozens of partners in the Mon Forest region has been a really amazing learning experience to see how when we all come together and we understand we each have pieces to contribute and those pieces can be technical support, they can be building new assets and they can be investment opportunities, we can start to ratchet up the economic development in those places. And you're seeing it in many of those communities, including in Richwood, which is in this region. Yeah, so for us, I mean, I think it's really important to acknowledge that when we look at these communities that work collaboratively together, they each do have sort of a, a, a niche or a niche that they're bringing to the overall regional approach. So um, I think we're fortunate in the New River Gorge region that we acknowledge that each community is bringing a different experience for the outdoor enthusiast. So sort of to your point, we know that when, whether they're tourists that are coming to visit or um, the general workforce and the population that occupies a community, they want these walkable downtowns. And so um, we have to ensure that we're investing in the spaces and places as both public and private industry to make sure that we have these usable spaces. And for us at the West Virginia Hive, that's really important because we have a lot of entrepreneurs that want to locate um, and there's nowhere for them to locate. So it's, it's a very unique opportunity for us to be able to work with our local stakeholders and private industry to provide these spaces for businesses to grow and thrive and contribute back to the economic impact. And so that's really huge. And we see it, we do see the, the easiest, the path of least resistance is in the outdoor community. They want those walkable downtowns and those communities that have these spaces and places. And so I think the Mom Forest Towns is a great example of the work that's been done with the DARE initiative. And it really has sort of broken that mold for looking at um, the collaborative effort across multiple communities and acknowledging what each of them bring to an overall industry. Um, so, what are you seeing, Jordan? So, is, is there a particular policy or, or any legislative effort that you really highlight as the most effective to making our communities and economies better and ensuring that the legislature is kind of on top of prioritizing that downtown redevelopment and that community development? Yeah, it's a great question, and I'll tell you, it's always a puzzle. Right? It's not just a silver bullet, it's not just one piece, it's hundreds and thousands of pieces that you have to put together to make the puzzle work, right? And so, as I mentioned earlier, getting the environment right, which we've been doing the last decade, is great. Uh, providing the incentives necessary to be competitive, as we talked about. One thing I will say that we haven't mentioned yet is the marketing that we've done as a state through Secretary Ruby's office and, and uh, the EDA and the DED. Um, every single year in the budget, we put money and allocate funding toward our marketing department, our, our Secretary of Tourism department. And how many people watched the National Championship game last night? Anybody? Did you see the West Virginia commercial on there? We are consistently advertising ourselves to the, to the region, to the surrounding states, and to the world. And one, um, I had a friend, Dave Harvickson, as you know, uh, was a friend of mine, president of Adventures on the Gorge over in Fayette County, and he was involved in a study one time. And the study basically showed that for every one dollar of marketing that we did as a state, we would bring in seven to eight dollars of spending or investment in the state. The return, I mean, it's science, it's math, the return on investment we get from our marketing dollars is phenomenal. 
And so one of the things that we have committed to do as the legislature is to continue to fund that department, continue to fund our marketing efforts, because at the end of the day, we have all these great mountains, we have these outdoor activities, we have great uptowns, downtowns, et cetera. If nobody knows you have them, who's coming to visit them? And so one of our focus uh, areas has been on the marketing side, and I think that's really, really proven effective. Um, the return on that, and Secretary Ruby, I, I don't know if she's gonna be a part of the next couple of days. Tourism will be part of Great, she will have the, the, the numbers on that, but she's done presentations every year, and we continue to grow year after year. And so I will say that, you know, with the recent announcements we've had in, in businesses and companies, you know, as I said, it's not one piece of the puzzle. We can talk about uptown, downtown development. A rising tide lifts all boats. And so as we get job and career announcements, as we hear about expansions, that lifts the entire economy up. That puts more money in people's pockets. I, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to, you know, cut taxes, cut the income tax, so that you have more to spend and more to invest in your, your areas. So um, we've done a lot right as, as it concerns the environment and incentives. Um, the marketing side is huge. And, and I just want to say that, um, you know, <laughs> to your point of, of a couple of other things, we also have to be adaptive, and I think we have been, to the changing needs of customers and business. You know, as, as Jenna mentioned, you know, 10 years ago, you, I never heard about childcare being a huge need. I mean, I mean maybe I was, I was in the dark, but, but after COVID and as of uh, recently, you know, that's a piece of the puzzle where we have to get better and we have to improve and we have to be competitive. And, and, and I can't emphasize this enough, anything that any other state is doing to grow their economy, to participate in economic development, to foster an environment for growth, we have to get up with the times on. We have to. It's not a choice. It's not, oh man, you know, we can let that one go. We have to do all of the above. And so it used to be we could you know, walk and chew gum, right? That was the old saying. Well, now we have to walk, we have to chew gum while typing out an email while talking on the phone all at the same time and put it all together. And so I think we've gotten a, a good, done a good job with that. And, and one of the last things I'll mention that, that we've done an incredible job when I hit on it earlier a little bit is being responsive and being um, and cultivating our relationships to be responsive to folks that are looking to grow, that are looking to locate here. You know, as a legislator, I've got access to just about everybody in the state government from the governor's office on down. Everybody is rowing the same boat in the same direction of economic development right now. And so if, if I call and I say, hey, I've got a company on the phone that needs X, Y, and Z, we can make those meetings happen instantly, the next day if need be. And so we need to continue to foster those relationships, um, the, the collaboration efforts that we've talked about, and make sure that we're all on the same page together. So at the end of the day, we are doing a lot of good things as evidenced by you know, the recent job announcements, career announcements, the expansions. Um, and, and you know, for a statistic that many of you may not know about, yes, we've lost population as a total, but we have had more net in-migration in the state of West Virginia than out-migration over the last two and a half to three years. And that is a big thing, that is a huge reversal. And so we want to continue doing what we're doing to reverse those trends because we need to keep you know, bringing population to our state. Yeah, I really appreciate what you mentioned about marketing at the beginning. And so I do think that it, it has always been and has will continue to be um, such an important investment from the state of West Virginia to ensure that we're out there and we're competitive. And I know locally we work really closely with um, our regional CVBs and our community CVBs to make sure that they're at the table, even if um, it doesn't always make sense when they're at the table, they're there and they're hearing what is happening and they're understanding the workforce need, because oftentimes they're, they, they, they have innovative approaches to marketing an area that also lends to traditional economic development, not just um, visitation rates. And so we very much appreciate the relationships that we have um, with, with those that are the subject matter experts, right? Um, and, and, you know, I also appreciate what you said and, and do hear often when we're working with companies that want to locate in the region or the state, um, one of their biggest um, concerns is, well, how long is it going to take me to get a decision? And to Jordan's point, sometimes it's literally a phone call. I mean, I think Nucor was the fastest uh, permitting process that we had ever seen in the state of West Virginia. Um, most often at a local level, I can attest to, 
it's a couple meetings and a phone call and decisions are made about incentives because they recognize the importance of job creation. And so that is one thing that we really do um, highlight when we are marketing and recruiting for, for job creation in the region is, you know, it's, it's a phone call away. It's calling two or three folks to call two or three more folks and get a decision made. So it is a very collaborative approach. Can I add one more thing sure. too yep. that, that I think I would be remiss if I didn't mention is, is really supporting our education. Um, everything from coding in elementary schools all the way up through supporting, uh, financially contributing to Marshall's cybersecurity program uh, within the last year, year or two. Um, as Jen mentioned, workforce is, is a critical component. You can have all the ingredients for the cake. And if you don't have that last ingredient for a work ready workforce and an educated workforce, um, you're not going to land the company. And so I think we've done a better job of diversifying our school system, uh, allowing competition. Uh, and I'm not trying to get too political on the, the Hope Scholarship and public school, this and that, but I will say it's, it's big when you can advertise and market that, hey, you've got choices when you come to West Virginia about where you send your kids to school and, and how, how, uh, how we're educating our workforce and our future workforce. So I'd be remiss if I didn't say that. I wanted to mention that as well. I wanted to add to this too, because the thing that has been really marked market to me about the Mon Forest Town is the marketing, right? So they have been very intentional, which I think this region is doing too around the National Park, in understanding that marketing drives people coming in and moving from just staying in a single place to understanding there are multiple towns that I can visit on my weekend or week-long trip. There are multiple different experiences that I can have. Like you said, Jenna, the different towns have different assets, they have different histories, it's a different experiential um, activity by going there. But you don't know that if you don't get that information. My husband and I went on a trip before we had kids along the Delta Blues Trail, which is like basically along the Mississippi River down to Louisiana. And this is a very impoverished region, very small towns, but it has this history of music, of creating incredible music. And what was really interesting to me that they did from a marketing perspective was every town worked together and they had a list every week of different live music activities that were happening. So you could build your vacation around what was happening in each town. That to me was an example of them working collaboratively and then thinking about how are we sharing information about what's happening every day in our own communities with everyone who's visiting us so that they can have a really unique experience and want to come back. The other thing I want to say though is that when we're attracting all this tourism to small towns, there has to be community involvement so that the community is bought in to what is happening to their towns. They feel excited about the growth and about the people that are coming in, and they feel like they have a voice in what's happening with the direction of their town. And I think that's where community and economic development can work really hand in hand so that you have a friendly and welcoming community that's excited about growing and also doesn't feel territorial about wanting all that growth in their one single town, but understands you know, when we spread it out, it, as you said, it lifts all boats. Yeah, and I think a really good, that's kind of the beauty of having a um, legislatively bound region because we recognize that there are subject matter experts in different areas throughout our entire region and we work with them to educate one another. So I think, you know, similar to what you mentioned about the small communities that are trying to build a, a um, coordinated effort around their business hours or the events that they're offering. We heard that from businesses in Hinton that wanted to figure out how they could you know, coordinate efforts and make sure that when folks visited they had shops open at the same time and they all were marketing that correctly. And we called in who we consider the, the subject matter experts in our region and the Beckley Raleigh County Chamber went to Hinton and talked to them about how the chamber can be involved in that. 
and and how they can help sort of market those efforts and uh, build out some of those help build out some of those strategies and so in the same vein we've had um, a really robust wayfinding group in some Hinton Summers County and that wayfinding group has worked with us and and one another to develop the Explore Summers County initiative and rebrand the wayfinding throughout Summers County and that core initiative has sparked wayfinding throughout the rest of the region um, so our other counties are starting to participate. And so, again, they're no longer looking at it as a competition. They're looking at it as a collaboration, and communities are understanding the importance of working together. And at a state level um, and a federal level, I think that's what attracts um, the investment and the policy change is not one single municipality screaming that they need support in one area. It's that collaborative effort and that larger effort that, again, sort of um, acknowledges the bigger issue and allows you all to act um, to make change. And so um, we're seeing it across our region, we're seeing it across the state, and so it's very important. Um, and I think if nothing comes out of today, collaboration is, is, the biggest, um, it is the biggest thing that we should all take away. So as we move towards the sort of the, the next phase of our fireside chat, I'd like to talk about um, sort of what COGS are in motion or what is happening that folks might not be aware of. So um, we talk a lot today about housing and childcare and how we're on the cusp of figuring out some policy priorities and educating legislators on the importance of this. But we also understand that, to your point earlier, we need to move at the speed of business and not the speed of government. And so sometimes those are conflicting needs. We need childcare and housing to move at the speed of business, not the speed of government. We're fortunate that the legislator is prioritizing these and have created policies. But I wonder, are there other things that that we need to be focused on or that that are sort of bubbling up that um, are in motion I know for us um, in our region it is is very much um, the development in the further development of the outdoor economy and so focusing on the outdoor manufacturers and the having the assets ready for outdoor manufacturers to locate we know that outdoor manufacturers look very different than traditional manufacturing. They're small, they like to use local um, workforce and contract entrepreneurs. They, um, they like to have very specific skill sets in cut and sew and textiles. They also want to locate in the community, not away from the community. They want to be in redeveloped school buildings or redeveloped um, downtown areas. And we also know that they contribute back to their communities um, in a sustainable way. And so knowing that outdoor manufacturers want to locate near where they can test their project product, we know that we're prompt for that in the New River Gorge region. So that's sort of, um, a, again, a priority that we're focused on and something that we're seeing bubbling up in traditional economic development is really that creative and innovative approach to recruitment of the outdoor manufacturing industry. So do you all have things that you're recognizing that you see bubble up? Yeah, a big thing that the hub has been focused on is how do we fill a gap that we have right now in West Virginia around community-based developers. So people, businesses, individuals, private, nonprofit, public, whatever they are, that are investing in redeveloping the built environment in our downtowns. There's tons of work that's happening around site development and large industry attraction. And there's a lot of work happening around marketing and small business development support. And there's a gap piece in there around who is putting their money on the table to invest in redeveloping those buildings, who is coordinating building owners, many of whom are retiring, elderly, would like to, you know, receive the asset of their building and pass it on to its, ne its next best use. The challenge is that many of the buildings in our communities are historic properties and they are extremely expensive to redevelop. So the return on the investment is just not there, right? So it doesn't attract traditional private investment or traditional private developers unless they have like a heart for that community, which is basically they're doing mission-driven development. In some places in the state, they have community-based developers 
or community development corporations that have a long-term investment in doing that work and putting together the really complicated financial stacks that are required to make these buildings happen and the often 10 plus years that it takes to get them done. So we have major gaps in the state of places that just don't have those entities available or they're heavily relying on a single person and pray to God nothing happens to that person or they decide they don't wanna, they wanna invest their money in something else, right? So we need to have a more intentional strategy of building the capacity of our state and building a, a really, uh, I would say pipeline of mission-driven community-based developers that are working hand-in-hand -hand with the economic development partners to move forward those downtown redevelopment opportunities. I'm on the board of a regional impact investment fund. I see like the regional investment opportunity and resources that are out there for downtown redevelopment. There are not places for that money to come into right now. So that is what I think I'm very excited about is there is real alignment in the state right now. There are emerging community-based developers that want to do this work, but we really have to ratchet it up the activity to take advantage of the opportunities that we have right now, the investment resources that are out there to, you know, bring it all together. Yeah, and a recent a recent example of that community based development um, was the Tiger Hotel that opened. That was a phenomenal redevelopment project that um, we're so fortunate to have the Wood Woodlands Development Group in West Virginia, but they only serve a certain portion of the state. And so we often joke and say, we wish that we could have Woodlands and Dave Clark everywhere because we would all be better for it. But that project was not easy. And Woodlands you know, created a very uh, attractive capital stack and found investors to invest in the old hotel and now it is officially open and it's a beautiful facility in Elkins and I would encourage anybody to visit and see what um, real community-based investment and redevelopment looks like um, because again it took a lot of partners and a lot of investors um, to get that project done and we need we do need more of that so Jordan sort of to pivot to you what what are you seeing what are yeah one topic I'll bring up is uh maybe a slightly controversial topic with some folks, but uh, the realm of energy and energy production uh, in the state, in the country, and around the world. Um, as everybody knows, West Virginia has a rich history of extraction, coal, natural gas, natural resources, and I want to tell you, I'm trying to dive down the political rabbit hole here, I am 110% for our coal, 110% for our natural gas. So I love, uh, I love our extraction industry, I love our coal mines and our, our gas wells. But I was at a conference last year outside of Tacoma, Washington. And it was a conference of numerous state legislators everywhere from California, Texas, Rhode Island, Florida, you name it. Uh, it was about 60 to 75 of us, so somewhere in there. And it brought together a whole host of folks that have differing views on the future of energy for our country. And let me tell you, it went from all the extremes of we're all going to die in five years if we don't get rid of coal and natural gas, too. On the other end, no renewables whatsoever. We stick with what, what's made the, the country great, et cetera. And so it really is eye-opening to say that, you know, we as a country are very diverse, and, and the business community in the country is very diverse in their portfolio needs and what they're looking for when they're looking at West Virginia. And I can tell you, every single day we've gotten um, the, the requests go across our desks about companies looking to move into West Virginia, and they, you go through all the lists, right? Sites, workforce, tax, regulatory environment. But then it comes to sometimes how much of your energy production is green or renewable. And so I bring this topic up to say that we as a state have been wrestling with this and, and trying to balance the uh, development and fostering of new business, attracting new industry in the state, while also respecting and supporting what got us here and what made us great. And so I think we've done a good job of that so far. But the, the last point I want to make on um, coal as an example, there are so many new technologies coming out now for the different uses and benefits of coal. Not just power plant production 
and energy production. And so we as a state have really embarked on, okay, what are those technologies? How can we support those technologies that can, we can still utilize, whether you want to say it's the federal government quashing the industry, technology quashing, whatever you want to say, take the politics out of it. At the end of the day, there will be more competition in the future. So how do we continue to utilize what we have and make good profits on what we have going forward. And there are a lot of exciting things on the horizon and I firmly believe we're gonna take advantage of those going forward. That's a really good point. Um, and so, you know, we, we recognized when we prioritized the aerospace industry in Raleigh County specifically and in the region, it was because of the transferability of skills from the coal industry. We also acknowledged that the coal industry and the residuals from coal often make the carbon fiber airplane components that our MRO and AMT mechanics will operate on when we locate them here. And so we do recognize the the need for alternative energy sources, but also um, alternative uses of coal residuals and coal byproducts, um, which this is a, a good, you know, sort of segue to some of the work that we've done with the West Virginia Community Development Hub. It's not obviously on our script, but we're very fortunate to be partners um, on an initiative that was led by um, Coalfield Development and the West Virginia Community Development Hub and a host of other partners um, through our Act Now Coalition, which is the largest and most historic investment in um, West Virginia from the Economic Development Authority and through the Build Back Better initiative. So Stephanie, um, what are, you know, our work obviously is um, in our community business resiliency initiative um, and our partnership with the hub on that is not to reshape the uh, narrative or the, um, the, the need for the coal industry. It's acknowledging its importance and how it can be utilized in a different fashion while um, ensuring that we do have those competitive alternative forms of energy production in the state. So can you elaborate on that work? Yeah, that's, I was just gonna talk about <clears throat> the work that we're doing, we call it around um, resilience, you know, and it's really crazy to be sitting here today talking about it because just last week we got hit by tornadoes, right? And um, I live very close to where the tornadoes hit in Nuttall and there is significant weather-related events that are happening to us and our buildings are not prepared for those events. And we're also um, constantly in a struggle of recovery from those events. And it, it's really devastating what has happened in that community and shocking to be hit by a tornado in Fayette County, West Virginia, twice. <laughs> um, but with our work with the Act Now Coalition and another uh, new program I'll talk about in a second, we're really looking at how do we invest in building resilience in communities so that we are not so dramatically impacted by floods and tornadoes and whatever else might be coming our way. And that really is about thinking about how do we increase the strength of the buildings, the uh, green infrastructure in our communities, and um, the efficiency of the buildings. So the Community and Business Resilience Initiative is a program that we're doing with the Hive and with Advantage Valley and the Brownfields Assistance Centers at WVU and Marshall. And it's really about putting together a wraparound suite of packages for communities to do resilience planning and development that's about brownfields remediation and reuse, small business development and community planning and engagement. And I'll also say that we are taking applications for that program right now. The applications close on Monday. So if you want your community to have that wraparound support services, really heavily concentrated resources, including up to $40,000 of technical assistance funds, apply. Go to wvhub.org and apply. And you know, $40,000 might not sound like that much, but as I said in my comments, our communities have a 50 to one leverage rate for our resources, right? So we expect you to bring in millions of dollars of external resources to match the money that we put on the table and we help you to do that too. I'm also on the steering committee of a project that 
just was awarded funds last week, which is called the Green Bank for Rural America Project. It's a climate uh, resilience investment strategy, right? So it's $500 million of investment resources that the um, Appalachian uh, community capital is expecting to leverage $13 billion of private capital to match. This is a national program, but our program is the only one in the country that is focused on rural and coal impacted, uh, coal reliant uh, places. So West Virginia is first in line for those resources and those opportunities. What do the funds go into? It's housing development. It's build new buildings, efficient buildings. It's about heat pumps and you know, car chargers and all kinds of the new resources that are gonna be built that there are a lot, there's a lot of funding for and that we would be remiss, I think, to let pass us by because as I said, there is all of this capital out there and it's really a question of do we have the projects that are ready? Going to your point about competing, you know, we're going to be competing across the country with other places that are ready with housing projects, that are ready with building development projects. And, you know, I, I think West Virginia is competitive and the opportunity is here. Yeah, that's a really great point on especially the Accelerate Community applications. Um, so as Stephanie mentioned, we're a partner in that work. Amy Showalter on my team can help uh, get an application in for any of the communities that um, are interested in applying. But really, um, such a crucial investment with the Green Bank. I mean, that was a huge announcement, and it's a huge resource for us. And so we need ready projects, we need willing community members, and we need folks that are willing to come to the table and not be scared by the green label that's often on a lot of these projects because it really is um, not about um, not acknowledging the coal industry and the rich history that continues to um, be in our in the Appalachian region, but it's really about acknowledging alternatives to um, such a valuable industry that, that exists. And so um, really appreciate the work that's being done by both the state and partner organizations to help bring this to light and, and figure out what is that unique balance that we need to walk as um, a primarily extraction state. So um, as we sort of close out today before we move into the Q&A section, I want to just make sure we've highlighted um, what is still needed and specifically around um, any, any sort of large gaps that we don't have um, plans for or legislation for or what does, um, what, what do we need to bring together in order to educate folks and in order to educate organizations like ours and educate legislators on what is needed and how to help because um, we all don't know what we don't know and without learning from the public and learning from our elected officials and learning from our communities, there's no way that we can make decisions or um, be competitive in a lot of these spaces. And so when we think about what is still needed and how we can help address those gaps, what is, is one thing or what is a, a, a final note that you'd like to acknowledge that folks need to understand um, about acknowledging what's needed and how to solve for it? Okay, so taking it out of the like investment space into reality, uh, so we're all parents of young children up here and we have talked about childcare already, but you know, I think that I just want to re-emphasize that people make decisions about where they live and if they have to move based on childcare access and based on, like you were saying, education and quality of education. And so we can build the most beautiful downtown, you know, we can do all the work to attract businesses. And if parents can't take their children to a place to have them cared for while they're working, they will move, right? So that to me is like an essential infrastructure piece. And one of the things uh, that we've been talking about an initiative the hub is part of called USDA Rural Partnership Network is what are some of the unintended effects or consequences of 
um, the activities that have taken place around improving our education resources and support, and how does that affect the child care field, right? So we need more teachers in the school, we need more support in the school, but we have to understand that there's actually a pipeline of workers that go from child care centers to the local schools, and how are we building that pipeline so that our child care centers aren't losing all of their workers to the schools, and they're able to attract new quality workers and train them and support them. You know, so it, I think it has to be thought of as like an ecosystem, right? It's not just education here and childcare there, but it actually, as a parent, it's the same thing. You know, your children, my children go to school and then they go to daycare and then I come pick them up. I need both of those things to be operating effectively. So I hope that, and I guess I'll just say this to you directly, I hope the legislature keeps prioritizing this, understands the urgency of the moment, um, and understands the need for us to figure out creative approaches to child care that work for our really small towns. You know, what's gonna work in Pittsburgh is not gonna work here in the Gorge region, and we have to figure out what works best for us. Yeah, and so, you know, obviously that, it, it is such a crucial need. I mean, it's, I think, whatever is more extreme than crucial is what the child care need is. And I think to your point, Stephanie, we have to look at it as childcare is not just infant care and it's not just, um, you know, under school age children care. It is care from the child all throughout their experience before and after school, during the summers. Um, and we are fortunate that we have supportive partners that, um, Actually, my husband called three times because he couldn't find my daughter's shoes before this panel. So um, we're very you know, fortunate that we have supportive partners, but we also understand that this is vitally important to um, ensuring that we have a functioning workforce. I think one very shocking data point that we have at NRGRDA is over, I've been the executive director since 2019. And since 2019, we have located, we, we have attempted to locate um, back office facilities, and when I say back office, that's like administrative facilities, call centers. Um, we have attempted to locate 10 call centers or back office facilities in the New River Gorge region. And while we had the location, we had the um, all of the parking spots that the building required for the employees, we lost every single time because of lack of access to available childcare spots. 10 back office facilities in our region is a huge economic impact for us. And we've lost every single one of them because of lack of childcare. And so we acknowledge that while traditional economic development does focus on moving dirt and building out infrastructure, these are crucial infrastructure needs. Childcare is a crucial infrastructure need for us to be able to be competitive for job creation and business location. And so again, to Stephanie's point, we will continue to work with our, the Rural Partners Network. I know I see Melissa in the audience today. Melissa Calagrasso is a key part of the state's child care advocacy. She runs a successful child care facility in Oak Hill with a place to grow, but she's also pivoting her work to work with larger organizations and advocacy around child care. She's at the legislature more than most legislators are <laughs> during this session, um, and she works with a lot of organizations, and she, she is um, vital, a vital resource for um, where to be heard about access to child care. I know that she has information about town halls that they're hosting and is a very um, connected resource in the child care um, industry. And so we're, we're supporting the child care industry's efforts and we're hearing them and we're trying to help solve for them. So um, Jordan, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, uh, a couple points I want to make. Uh, first of all, thank you for the feedback. Thank you for the feedback. Yep. I will tell you, um, I work with 99 other delegates and 34 senators. And I, I truly can say this, we are responsive to the public's opinions and feedback and recommendations. And so don't hesitate at all or don't stop from reaching out to us in your legislature, those that represent you, and talk about your issues. We want to be a representative of you and to be um, um, conducive to your needs, we to be responsive to your needs and the needs of the community. So that's, that's the first point. Second point I'll make is um, something that, that we've gotten better on and, and we need to make improvement on is being able to leverage our dollars. 
As a state, I talk in dollars and cents. We always talk about the budget. That's one thing that we have to do every single year is pass a budget and allocate our money. Um, the federal government allocates billions upon billions upon billions of dollars every single year for every niche program and thing you can think of. The problem a lot of times is we can't be competitive because we don't have the matching dollars for it. You know, whether it's EDA, USDA, whatever alphabet soup agency there is out there that is putting money out there to the public to be competitive on, we at the local level, at the state level, the county level, the municipal level, the nonprofit level, the EDA level, we have to have monies available to go and leverage to be competitive and be eligible for those funds. And so I think as a state, we've done a better job as, as county commissions and as you know, city governments, as EDAs, we've done a better job. But, but let me tell you, there's so much more to access, to draw down. And regardless of how you feel about our recent spending binges from the federal government, throw that out the window. It is spent, so let's go take advantage of it. Let's go after it. It's there. And quite frankly, we've put a lot of tax dollars into circulation from West Virginia through our industries. Let's get some of those back. So I think leveraging those dollars, making dollars available to be leveraged is a huge thing that we need to continue to improve on. Couldn't have said it better. We just released a report on barriers to rural communities accessing federal funding with West Virginia as a case study. Match was the number one issue. And Yes, we can find it some places. There may be opportunities for us to scrounge it together. But what we said is that we think that the federal government can actually be more lenient with their match requirements, especially for our communities in West Virginia. So, you know, we're pushing them to say, you know, it's not realistic. You're doing tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars of um, of opportunities, we don't have tens and hundreds of millions of dollars to match that with. You got to bring it down. So, you know, I think it is a great opportunity. It's a challenge. It's always going to be a challenge for us, and we have to figure out how to be creative about it. And, and I just want to emphasize when we're talking about leveraging, we're not just talking about leveraging, oh, we have to come up with 75% and we drone out 25%. Oftentimes, it's the opposite. We only need a quarter of the total funds to draw down the other three quarters of the money, or 50-50. And so these dollars go a long way. Our, our little bit gets a lot of bang for the buck if we can um, qualify and, and receive these awards. So um, that's just something we need to focus on. Yeah, we, we obviously absolutely agree. Um, the Hub has done a great job around educating around access to barriers to federal investment. The state is very aware, obviously, of the challenges accessing and match continues to rise to the top. I will commend our local uh, county commissions across our four county footprint. They've done a really great job at hearing out all of the projects and spreading their federal investment to match as many projects as they possibly can so that we can see some of these dollars get spent. But we also acknowledge that yes, while there are hundreds of millions and billions of dollars available, that there are barriers to accessing that money. And we appreciate the acknowledgement of those at the state level and at the community level that continue to advocate for um, federal regulation to change in order to access that money. So we're nearing the end of our panel together. This has been a great conversation today. Um, and I want to make sure before we close out, we don't have any audience questions. So um, I'm going to open it up for just a minute. If we have any questions from anybody in the audience that want to be asked, um, feel free to do so. OK. Yeah, and Karen said if anyone wants to venture to the podium and join us on stage um, or also yell really loudly, we also have, um, you know, we'll be around for a little bit and we have contact information for any of the uh, panelists up here and obviously everyone should have Jordan's number on speed dial at this point. Um, if you don't, I'm happy to share that. <laughs> and um, we will continue to encourage conversation around a lot of these crucial um, infrastructure priorities and a lot of these policy priorities um, as we continue through both the election cycle and the next legislative session. Um, so if no one has any questions, I'm going to go ahead and thank our panelists for joining me today and uh, really appreciate it and look forward to communicating with you guys over the next two days. Jenna, let's all give them a round of applause. So again, we want to thank Jenna Belcher with New River Gorge Regional Development Authority. She's the executive director there. 
and her panel, Stephanie and Jordan. Um, the fact that they're all here and they took this time out of their very busy days to come and share information with us. We just want them to know how much we appreciate that. We also appreciate the sponsor of this first session. Again, Klockner Pentaplast. They have a, a booth right back here to my left. And Klockner Pentaplast, as Jenna mentioned, they have firsthand experience of taking advantage of some of those incentives that we have in place here in our area and in the state. So um, be sure to stop by their booth and, and visit with them. Before I go any further, I also want to thank our presenting sponsors for this whole event, and that is the cabins at Pine Haven to my right. So please join me in thanking them with a round of applause. I also want to mention that if we were in a small classroom, I would say, so what's it mean to be inaugural? And hopefully somebody would say, well, it's the first time, right? Somebody nod your head. Okay. So this is the inaugural Future Forward event. And we under, you know, we're, we're figuring it out and we're really excited about the format we have in place. Just a reminder, we do have breaks and networking opportunities scheduled into the day. So we're getting ready for that first big break uh, where you can visit all of the exhi exhibitor tables. So that being said, then this afternoon when our other sessions are taking place, we would just invite you to really um, take in what's being shared. There's a reason these sessions are being presented and then we're having the Meet the Candidates forums. It's all to make us more informed, and um, we just appreciate everybody being here, um, and we want you to take advantage of these networking opportunities. I'm also going to put a plug in for a session that's going to be offered tomorrow. You heard a lot about education in this first panel, and we're going to have a gentleman with us tomorrow. His name, he's actually here already, David Goldberg. Are you out there? Can you wave your hands, David? I can't see you. David Goldberg. Excel Together West Virginia. Is he waving? I can't see him. Okay. He's back that way. <laughs> but he is here to talk to us about his program. It's called Excel Together West Virginia. And that is designed to help school age children with their math skills. There's an opportunity to fill the gap there. And so David Goldberg with Excel Together West Virginia. Michelle's trying to get his attention. <laughs> anyway, he's going to be presenting to us tomorrow afternoon. So I think that's something we're all going to be very interested in. So at this time, I would like to invite everybody to enjoy our first networking break. You can grab a bite to eat behind me at the concession stand, visit with the exhibitors, take advantage of this opportunity to network with one another, and then we will reconvene about 12.55 and get started with our afternoon. Thank you all for being here. <laughs>